G'day, I'm Martin Isles, and this is The Truth of It. And today, what are we going to be talking about? Well, first up, we're going to be talking about Facebook killing Australian news media from its platform. Secondly, we'll be talking about the British High Court decision that is uh, changing the conversation on transgenderism in children and the treatment of it. And off the back of that, I felt the need to talk a little bit about the truth, about what it means to be a man and a woman for today's generation. We're going to be talking about God's gender agenda. Yes, I'm really going there. But first up, let's talk about Facebook killing Australian news. And this segment's going to be slightly rough and ready because it's really just happened at the time of filming. But effectively, uh, all of you who are in Australia will have noticed that Facebook has kicked Australian news media off its platform pretty much entirely. Uh, it seems it was all fun and games when the US president got banned, but now many of the people that were having the fun and games are getting a little bit of a taste of their own medicine. Um, news media cannot be shared on the platform and has become, it's become effectively invisible to users. And as you can imagine, they're not very happy because it's going to really harm traffic to their websites. On the other side of the coin, I have seen a lot of more conservative types instinctively sticking the boot into Mark Zuckerberg and Facebook, saying that they're too powerful, how dare they interfere with the laws of a foreign government, and uh, to use Prime Minister Scott Morrison's phrase, he said they have unfriended Australia. Now, I want to just say I am no Mark Zuckerberg fan, that's for sure, and I say this as somebody who does not expect to have a long life on his platform. Uh, I suspect one day I will not be there. Um, but uh, nonetheless, this time, I'm kind of on side with Facebook's point of view. I don't know whether the whole banning thing was too far or whatever, but the opinion they have behind that action, I think, is correct. Let me explain this. And I want to be clear, this is not a question of thus saith the Lord, it's not a Christian conviction issue, but I thought I could clear it up for people to try and explain. This all comes down to new laws that have been proposed by the Australian government, the Media Bargaining Code. And these laws would force digital platforms, including Facebook and Google, to pay the mainstream media lots of money for them having a presence on Facebook and Google. And that sounds a little bit strange, uh, given the enormous benefit that the media derive from being there, and indeed they're only there and only got on there because it suited them. And Facebook doesn't pay others for their presence on the platform unless it's through the monetization of their content, which is open to everyone. So you might ask, well, what gives? Um, it goes like this. Facebook becomes popular. So news media decide that being on Facebook is a great idea. They sign up and they hire teams to curate and maintain their social media sites and content. And that's good news for news media. They get a lot of traffic from social media. But at the same time, something else is going on. Facebook and Google and a lot of others are becoming competitors for advertising revenue. They have managed, you see, to develop world-leading, sophisticated, highly effective advertising systems to target users in very clever ways. And therefore what happens is that advertising dollars start going away from the newspapers, they start going away from the TV channels, they go instead where? Well, to social media. Because you can get highly effective, targeted to a very granular level, advertising systems through Facebook, through Google, through other big tech companies. They've come in and innovated the market. And that's what the world is like. Innovation and disruption, it happens all the time. Change is the new normal, you know? That's something that uh, I've had to learn in management. Change is normal. We're always changing. Every business has to deal with it. You know, welcome to the world of compact discs and video stores and MySpace, you know? Innovation comes, new players come, new ways of doing things, and it reinvents the wheel. So you suppose that media might do what the rest of us do. But do they innovate? Do they do what businesses are forced to do usually? Get with the program, work with the social media algorithms, produce popular content, brainstorm new technologies? Nope, they don't do any of those things. They've cried foul, and this is a quote, they've said there is a power imbalance because they're being swamped by big tech. And so they go cap in hand to the federal government, begging to be saved from their inevitable demise if they don't change and adapt. And they twist their social media presence which they wanted for the benefits that it gives them, into some kind of privilege for Facebook, as if Facebook needs them and is the party that's deriving the benefit of their existence. What was Facebook's reply? Well, you actually account, says Facebook, for 4% or less of our Australian content. And we don't need you. Uh, you're not as crucially important to the world as you think you are, and begging for our cash doesn't make any sense. And so I think that Facebook's position is pretty fair. They've said, no, we won't pay you for having a place on our platform. 
And I don't know that, as I said, that the actions they've taken now, especially if they become permanent, which I don't think they will, but I'm not sure that they're right. But nonetheless, the conviction, which is that these new laws make no sense, I think are right. Look at the legislation. This is just a quick summary. It puts together a framework for news businesses to bargain with Facebook over the inclusion of their content on Facebook. Uh, they let Facebook know that they want to shop, they want to set up shop on the platform, uh, and then Facebook has to enter into ne negotiations with them about what to pay them. And if they can't agree, then an arbitrator will be appointed and they'll be forced to agree. The laws also require Facebook to notify the news businesses in advance of any upcoming changes to their algorithm and give information on how they collect user data on those who interact with the news content. Now that's the short version. And this really has been the result of lobbying from people like News Corp and Fairfax and, and all the big news media companies. It's just silly. It doesn't make any sense. This is just, I mean, this strikes me as older political types who are stuck in the Canberra bubble not realising that the world outside of their bubble, and particularly outside their generation within the bubble, has changed forever. It's the mainstream media clinging to life, unwilling to change their ways, demanding that they get propped up because they're so important and so central to the universe. How could we possibly live without them? You know, don't say this too loud, but pretty easily. The government has said of the code that digital platforms have fundamentally changed the way that media content is produced, distributed and consumed. That's right, disruption. This code underscores the Morrison government's efforts to ensure the Australian economy is stable to take full advantage of the benefits of digital technology while protecting a strong and sustainable Australian news media. You know, the issue here is not that the news media will go away. It never will. The issue is that the news media will have to change or die and be replaced by others who are prepared to change. That's what this is really all about. I mean, it's just markets 101. It's how it works. So what should they do? Well, like I said, they should get with the program or die and be replaced by others who are getting with the program. Social media can be extremely lucrative when leveraged properly plenty of people are making large sums of money off of it. The requirement is to produce content that is very popular and innovative. In other words, not ideologically curated to force people into a certain opinion, but actually curated according to what actually interests people. Stuff that's popular with people. That's what you've got to do, news media. Surprise. Earn their eyeballs. Like the rest of us, we experiment with different types of content, we're flexible, we adapt to algorithm changes, and we always monitor these things. Change is normal. Build up an alternative infrastructure, an app, for example, as some of them are already doing, a significant email database. These are things we've had to do. These are things we work on all the time. Activity on multiple platforms, maybe including some platforms that are a bit more conservative that you don't like. Get out there, spread yourself around. If you do all of that, and you still die. It literally means that you're irrelevant. Because that is how social media companies work. If people want your content, they get it. If your content is useful, informative, innovative, inspiring, enlightening, they will look at it, they will want it, they will get it. That's how the algorithm works. That's how Facebook works, notwithstanding censorship issues, which we all know about, but that's not what's at play here. End of story, it's as simple as that for the average news company. So this is media companies, in my view, in denial. And here's the other thing, that's what media companies should do. What should the government do? Well, the government should focus its efforts on ensuring that Facebook does not breach the basic principles at play for public square discourse, because Facebook now is the public square, right? Uh, and Australia has a public square and it's governed by certain principles of, you know, should be governed by certain principles of free speech and civic freedoms and things like that and discourse and debate and points of view. The Australian government should focus its efforts on making sure that Facebook is not attacking that or undermining that. That actually as a public square, it is upholding those basic civic freedoms that define the public square and isn't becoming authoritarian, isn't becoming totalitarian. That's what the government should be doing. Not... Um, not doing this crazy thing where they're propping up big media companies that won't innovate and may fail through sheer irrelevance and flat-footedness. I mean, this is big government gone mad, and the Morrison government is just so 
It's crazy. I read all the documentation on this and thought, am I missing something? I don't think I am. Uh, it really is what it seems to be. Um, what should Facebook do? Well, I don't think they should maintain the ban on news media. Um, I'm consistent in my view about free speech and whatnot, and I think that news media companies should be allowed to participate in social media on equal terms with other businesses and commentators. That has to be rectified. I believe it will be in the fullness of time. Um, I think this is a political statement of a temporary nature. Um, but they need to also unban small outfits, which have been caught up in this, which I sympathise with. There's a lot of small publishers and producers or online natives that, um, uh, you know, they, they've not been part of this media bargaining code at all. It's sort of been thrust upon them. So they should be unbanned. They should be freed up immediately. Um, but I understand the statement that Facebook are trying to make. I agree. Can I, I can't believe I'm, I'm agreeing with Mark Zuckerberg. Unbelievable. I, I just, but anyway, I am. I'm agreeing. Um, but news media should be allowed to back on Facebook. And then if they die anyway, they only have themselves to blame and the government shouldn't be there to save their bacon. It might just be that we're moving into a new era and they will adapt or die and be replaced by others who are prepared to adapt. So that is my take on that issue, an unexpected one, but I think that is really the truth about the news media bargaining code and Facebook's ban of news media on its platform. All right, second up, we're going to be talking about the Tavistock case. Now, this is a British High Court decision that is changing the conversation on gender dysphoria and the treatment of transgenderism in young people. It's called Tavistock versus, for the Americans, versus Bell. For the English and Australians, Tavistock and Bell. There's a different way of saying it. Uh, it's a High Court case out of the UK, etc. And it was actually handed down in December, but it's a big enough deal that I knew that I had to return to it at some point and deal with it in detail and explain to you what it's all about. What is Tavistock? It's a gender clinic, officially a gender identity development service. It's for children under the age of 18. The clinic administers puberty blockers to children as young as 10. It prescribes cross-sex hormones to children as young as 16. And it progresses with gender reassignment surgeries for adolescents from the, or for um, young people from the age of 18. An important point is this. Children are required to consent to their own therapies under the Tavistock principles and the way that it works and the way that these clinics work in general. The question before the court therefore was, can children even consent to those therapies? Do they have the capacity? Good question. Now, who is Belle? Remember, it's Tavistock and Belle. Who's Belle? Well, that's Kira Belle. She's a 23-year-old woman who was treated by the clinic on her pathway to becoming a trans man. Ms. Belle has now detransitioned, and uh, there's ongoing permanent effects of, what, of, of that, So, but nonetheless, she's detransitioned to the extent that she can, uh, and she sued the clinic for what it did to her, saying that she was not able to consent to the treatments that it provided, and indeed, no child is able to, and she wanted the court to make that finding, that a child cannot consent to these treatments, which are life-altering in ways that a child will never understand. And I think that's just on the face of it, fair enough because these are kids who cannot drive, who cannot drink, who cannot smoke. Some of them can't choose their own bedtime. They can't get a tattoo. They can't vote. But apparently they can decide whether they're a man or a woman and make irreversible actions to confirm it through medical treatments. That's my opinion. What did the High Court say? They had a lot of concerns actually that fed into their final conclusion. I want to list a few of those concerns. The first range of concerns, which is really worrying, was regarding to the practices of the clinic itself. They said the clinic did not keep records sufficient, uh, and I read the decision, they were quite skeptical of the clinic's practices in this regard, and indeed it looks like they were right. First of all, the clinic could not produce records of the ages of their patients, despite how young they are, and the experimental nature of the treatment and its profound impact. I mean, these kids are under 10, a lot of them. Uh, secondly, uh, the, the, the clinic did not keep records of how many of the children who came to it had autism. And that's a big issue because many of these children have autism and the question is, well, hang on, is it the autism that's the issue or the gender dysphoria that's the issue? But they couldn't tell the court how many had autism, even though many do. Thirdly, there was no information provided by the clinic about how many young people with gender dysphoria were not prescribed puberty blockers. Now, remember, the child has to consent to its own treatment. And so you would think there'd be many who couldn't. Well, the court said, well, how many? The clinic couldn't tell them. Uh, and the court said it was left with a strong impression that this rarely, if ever, happened, which is really concerning. Uh, a child feels gender dysphoric, bang, straight on the puberty blockers, straight down the pathway of treatment for you. Finally, the clinic could not say what proportion of young people who were prescribed puberty blockers progressed across sex hormones. Uh, and in each of these cases, the, court's quite, the court seems to suggest that they either could not or would not uh, which is even more concerning. Would not means they've got something to hide. And it's interesting, the court, that comes through from reading it. They said, well, they wouldn't supply the information. Uh, whether they could, 
Probably not, maybe, don't know. Uh, but they wouldn't provide information on how many of these kids on puberty blockers progressed to cross-sex hormone treatment. And again, the court said that almost all of them do so. That was the impression that it got. Okay, those are concerns about information, but they were also concerned about the information that they did have. And here's some of it. Between July 2019 and June 2020, so roughly a 12-month period, 161 children were referred to the clinic for puberty blockers. 26 of those children were under 13 years of age, and well over 50% of them were under 16 years of age. And in 2009, they also commented on now the increase in referrals overall to the clinic. So in 2009, 97 children were referred to the clinic. Fast forward to 2018, you have 2,519 children referred to the clinic. Now, these increases are similar in Australia, and they directly correlate with the rise and rise and rise of gender curriculum, you know, gender fluid, non-binary concepts being taught in schools. I mean, who would have thought that you put the idea into a child's head and they might actually get the idea and think that it's a good one? or start thinking about it, or start obsessing over it in the case of the autistic situations. Well, surprise, it directly correlates thousands of percent increases in children who are going for uh, treatments for gender dysphoria. It's very sad. There's a surge in female referrals. The court noted that in 2011, it was a 50-50 gender split between ma males and females in patients. By 2019, so not that many years, was that eight years or something? 76%, more than three quarters of patients were female. That is also a global trend. And there's specific reasons why young girls might be more vulnerable to these sorts of narratives. Again, it's very, very sad. More broadly, however, referring to the evidence for pu puberty blocker treatment in general, the court said the following. The court said puberty blockers cause a person to miss a period of normal adolescent development which can never be recovered or reversed. Now, that's important. Can never be recovered or reversed. They miss a period of normal adolescent development. They said that puberty blockers almost always result in a person progressing to cross-sex hormones, which are, quote, to a very significant degree not reversible. Okay, so that pretty much is the guaranteed pathway, except in rare cases. They said they agreed that there is no firm evidence to demonstrate the efficacy of puberty blockers, nor to properly understand their short and long-term consequences. They made the point there's barely any literature to help understand what are the consequences of these, these, these treat, this treatment long-term. It's very hard to say. They also agreed that puberty blockers cause gender dysphoria to persist, or they suggested it was a strong possibility, because of the evidence that if you don't use puberty blockers, the issue resolves itself in the vast majority of young people. And in this way, they speculated that puberty blockers may be confirming gender dysphoria by ensuring that that young person does not experience adolescence. That is also concerning. They said that the consequences of the treatment are, quote, highly complex and potentially lifelong and life-changing in the most fundamental way imaginable. Now, they also made the point that gender dysphoria is not a physically manifesting um, condition. It's psychological. And yet the treatments have uh, biological and physiological consequences, which did, doesn't seem to make sense. Look, I say all that. This is what the High Court of the United Kingdom is saying. I say all that because we need to really come face to face with how serious this matter is. Um, and the court was therefore well and truly doubting whether a child can consent to puberty blocker treatment. And specific factors they mentioned they were concerned over were one, the fact that the consequences are not even fully understood by adults. So how could they be fully understood by the child who's receiving the treatment? Secondly, there is a clear connection between puberty blockers, then cross-sex hormones, then surgery. Thirdly, uh, the loss of fertility issue is something that a child couldn't possibly understand the implications of, and also the impact on sexual function, the same. And I made this point that understanding the basic concepts is not the same as understanding how they will affect your adult life when you are a child. That level of understanding, they were sceptical whether a child could ever achieve it. And they concluded that for a young person under 16, there would be enormous difficulties understanding and weighing the implications of puberty blocker treatment. For children between 14 and 15, they said it was doubtful they could consent. For children under 13, they said it was, they said it was highly unlikely. Uh, now, in the world of legal speak, you don't tend to get stronger than that, um, so that's pretty strong. Um, but of course, in different legal contexts, it, those words can still, there's a little bit of wiggle room in them, but they're pretty strong in the legal universe. Um, 
And this case represents the first major pushback by a superior court in the United Kingdom or Australia, or perhaps in the whole Anglosphere world, um, in, a, in pulling apart the practices of the uh, of, of, of gender dysphoria, the treatment of gender dysphoria and the practices of these gender clinics which are on the rise and rise across the Western world. Now, frankly, none of this surprises me. And the truth is it's not just because of the activists in the schools. The activists are simply reaping a harvest from very, very ripe fields because they are answering questions to which children have no alternative answers. In other words, what is a man? What is a woman? No one has the guts to answer the question except the gender bending activists going into your child's school or writing books for the book club or writing scripts for Disney and all this kind of stuff. So I'm going to give some of those answers in the next segment. But meanwhile, that was the truth about the Tavistock case which is finally starting to change the conversation around the treatment of gender dysphoria in young people. We have a long way to go, but hey, small beginnings. Let's rejoice over that. All right, next up, what is a man and what is a woman? Uh, yes, I'm going to start to answer that question, believe it or not. Uh, this is a topic that I have spoken of in larger format in long lectures and I've called it God's Gender Agenda. And I spoke in the last segment about the disaster which is on the rise and rise in the West of gender dysphoria and gender confusion among our young people. The Tavistock case from the UK was another stark reminder of this, what I think is and believe is among the greatest humanitarian crises in our young people, in children in particular today in our Western societies. It's not spoken of that much, it's very serious. There are lifelong irreversible consequences of the trans affirmative messaging that's out there and the activists going into our schools. But see, the rise and rise of this does not surprise me. As I said in the last segment, they are simply, the activists going into the schools and the messages that are out there are simply reaping a harvest from very ripe fields. They are answering questions to which children have no alternative answers. People are not brave enough to answer the question, what is a man, what is a woman, unless they're a gender bending activist. I mean, take it from a millennial. One of the biggest uncertainties, and I can tell you this, I can't tell you how strongly I need to say this, one of the biggest uncertainties among young, that young people have is this. It is, what is a man? Who am I as a man? What is a woman? Who am I as a woman? And churches have almost totally vacated clear teachings on this subject because of fear and because, uh, perfectly, to be perfectly honest, there are older generations in particular who won't tolerate it, uh, probably because, well, I won't criticise, but they, uh, that's my experience, is that I do talk about these sorts of things, but only to young audiences, because they want to know and they're open to it and they know that it makes sense. But to older audiences, I always run into very severe trouble. Um, and it may be that, you know, when you live a life that doesn't obey, that doesn't adhere to the, the basic principles on this, uh, you don't want to face them. Um, but, uh, you know, your children, are gen your children you know, to those older people are genuinely yearning for an answer because they don't know. Uh, this is a world of be whoever you want to be, you do you, be who you are, self-expression, there's no clear boundaries. But young women know that they're women and they know that that means something. Young men know that they're men and they know that they, that means something and they're not sure what. And they are crying out for an answer. And that is why Jordan Peterson shot to overnight stardom. He was answering this very question, what are male and female? He was explaining that they are actual categories, that they matter and they make a difference and they give us different proclivities and desires and interests and they give us different purposes. And that's the important thing. And young people flocked to him all over the world in the millions. It was like a Billy Graham crusade. He was in something like 130 cities in just over a year and thousands and thousands and teeming thousands turned out to hear what he had to say. And this was one of his biggest themes. And in fact, it is the theme that made him famous. So I usually talk, to this, talk about this issue uh, to people under 35 until today. I'm going to talk about it to whomever will listen. Um, and I think it needs answering among Christians because it's not a controversy to be avoided. We are seeing with the deconstruction of gender, uh, with now the wholesale deconstruction of gender in a way that we could never have imagined, we are seeing that manhood and womanhood 
Uh, they're great glories to be discovered. They're great truths for a new generation. It, it, it really, really matters to save people from the most twisted and perverse lies, which are Satan's way of destroying people and burdening them with lifelong scars and trauma. Um, now, these are not psychological answers primarily. That was what I think Jordan Peterson's answers had in their limitation. This is how people feel. And you say, well, I feel different. So what does it matter? Um, it does matter because it's not just about how people feel. The data he was referring to, the studies he was referring to, were referring to realities that exist because it's by design. It's the purpose. It's what we were made for. Uh, and there are blueprints given to us in Scripture that give us the answers. Genesis 1 to 3 is the main place. And I'm going to spend, I reckon, oh, a, little over five, oh, yeah, a little over five minutes um, talking about these blueprints. And they're just primers, just starters. Male and female are first mentioned in Genesis 1 27, and they're discussed at length until the end of chapter 3 and several things are noted. The first is that they are made the same in certain key ways. And the first key way is, what does it say? It says, God says, let us make man in our image, in the image of God. And so God made man in his own image, in the image of God, he created them, male and female, he created them. So the first thing is that they are made in the image and likeness of God, both. Men and, e men and women are therefore equal before God himself and no difference to be discussed from this point forward is ever going to alter that. And the calling on them is the same, to image God as an ultimate calling. And for both in the New Testament, that is through Jesus Christ. Because we fell, we, this image of God that was in us then was defaced, but in Christ, we have the true image of the invisible God, uh, as it says in Colossians and several other places. Uh, and so through Christ, we both are called to image God. We are both equal before God in terms of uh, who we are, what we are, and in terms of uh, our salvation and our standing before God. The second thing, uh, the second manner in which men and women are the same is that they're meant for each other. And that comes out clearly in the narrative. You find out that one needed the other. It was not good for a man to be alone, it says. Uh, and that's the first thing that in all of scripture that's not good, even in paradise, not good. And so what happens? Well, God makes him someone else. He makes him a helper suitable to him is the language that is used. Uh, and from that truth stems marriage. Therefore, it says, uh, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife and the two shall become one. That is marriage. Um, and so they're meant for each other. The, one, the man was not himself by himself. And the woman, by extension, is not herself by herself. Now, what else are they the same in? Well, they have joint authority over the earth uh, to rule, to subdue, to have dominion, to the mandate to, 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 to get on with all that stuff. But also um, they have joint mandate to be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. And from there comes the family, right? Um, and uh, that's the ways in which they are the same or the main ways in which they are the same. But then, of course, the same narrative starts telling you how they're different, how they're different. Um, and these are some of the differences that are stated. First of all, we learn that the human race is sexually dimorphic. There's a male, there is a female, um, and God never makes things different without a purpose. And the purpose is described. He says male and female are made at different times. That's what we learn, first man, then woman, and a different, from different materials, man out of the dust, woman out of the man. And this sets up a creation order, by the way, which is significant through the entire Bible for different reasons. Um, and also he makes them with different stated purposes. And the curse when men and women fall in sin and God reads out the curse, basically, um, the curse applies to male and female differently, differently. So they bear the curse in different ways. But let me drill down into, firstly, their different purposes and secondly, the way they bear the curse differently. Regarding their different purposes, there are two words in this part of the Bible, in the creation narrative, which describe man only as he was created and which two which describe women, woman only as she was created. The words used in relation to the man, one English translation uses the two words worker and keeper. The Hebrew transliteration of the Hebrew words is abad and shamar. Abad means to work, to labor, in service, to serve. Isn't that significant? To labor, in service, to serve. It comes out in places like Ephesians 5, where it talks about the fact that all that the man does in his role is to basically burn himself to the ground and think nothing of himself and serve others, right? Uh, but anyway, it's abad. That's the first word. The second one is shamar. This means to have charge, to have charge, to guard, to watch, to protect, to save, to defend. Those two words are rich with meaning. 
and they have significance for the rest of the scriptures. Two words about the woman. The first one is when God says it's not good for a man to be alone, I will make him a helper suitable to him. And that word's used twice. It's Aza to describe the woman here in the, in the beginning. And it means one who helps, who suckers, who, for that's an old S-U-C-C-O-U-R, it's an old fashioned word with rich meaning, uh, who strengthens to render aid, especially as amplified through times of hardship. Now, anyone who thinks, by the way, that this word is in any way demeaning, God uses it to describe himself multiple times in the Old Testament. So it's not demeaning at all. Uh, helper, helper. The other word that's used in this part of the Bible is mother. Isn't that significant? Mother. And I won't go into that in detail now, but one of the main themes throughout the entire new, uh, Bible is the godly mother who is loved by God and used by God. It's very significant and particularly used in her motherhood and through her children to change the world. And that's something that so many women's Bible studies and books and whatnot simply just gloss over. It's a massive theme, right up to Mary being the absolute pinnacle of that, right? But also you've got Elizabeth, you, you've got uh, Moses's mother, Jochebed, you've got uh, Hannah, you've got Leah's an amazing motherhood story that's often overlooked. I could go on, there's heaps of them. Now these features of man and woman, Azer, Shammah, uh, and uh, what, Abad, and Mother, they beautifully complete each other. And that's the point. The man was not himself by himself. By extension, it applies to the woman too. And so they're complementary in that way, suitable to each other. Let me mention a few examples. I think I'm going to go over my five minute limit. Anyway, big deal. Um, a few examples of cultural phenomena in the modern time which speak to these. I'm going to say these quickly. But firstly, we all know that boys have a hero complex. They want to be heroes. They love heroes. They love role models. They love figures of strength. And they themselves are the strongest sex, physically. This is the big debate about trans people in sport right now. They're strong. And also boys can be, and at least they desire to be, mentally resilient. And we see a big attack on this at the moment. Boys need to be vulnerable. Well, hmm, boys tend to be more mentally resilient. Boys can get into rough and tumble. You know, boys can be much more physical. They can be, you know, much more energetic in that respect. None of these things are bugs. They are all features. Boys are not defective girls, okay? They're made as laborers, they're made as workers, they're made as defenders, they're made as protectors, they're made as those who guard, they're made as those who, who are strong, okay? That's how it was intended. They're not bugs, they're features. Secondly, boys grow through taking incremental responsibility. And this is one of the most important messages I could give to young men today. Because they're made to take that responsibility. You notice what that word meant, to have cha the, a keeper is the way it's translated in English. I think it was um, shama, was it? Yes. Uh, it means to have charge. It means to take responsibility. And you know, um, you notice Eve fell first, but Adam bears responsibility for it, right? It's significant. Men need to, there's nothing worse than a man who won't take responsibility. And for young men to grow, they need to take on that responsibility that they're called to, to shoulder those burdens, to lift those loads, to break through the fear that holds you back, to experience the failures that come inevitably from trying and picking yourself up and continuing. And one of the saddest things as I travel around is finding men who won't take responsibility. And I might add, women who won't let them take responsibility. But that's another story. But also young guys who don't seem able to finish things, don't seem able to achieve things, who aren't finishing their courses and their programs and finding something to sink their teeth into. Find something and do it and achieve something. Be responsible. Look around you, take it on and break through the fear that is stopping you. It's so important. But of course, men are made for that. It's a bug. I mean, it's a feature, not a bug. Here's another difference. People versus things. Men tend to be interested in things. Women tend to be interested in people. Isn't that interesting? It explains career choices, you know. The literature is showing, and Jordan Peterson drew attention to this, that for men and women, um, the differences between their career choices are amplified when freedom to choose is amplified. Women gravitate towards professions that have a stronger connection with people, with children, with support, with help, things like that. 
surprise. I mean, it's really not surprising. Uh, and men have a much stronger connection with those sorts of things that are science, tech, engineering. I mean, they can't get female engineers. Now, these are generalizations, of course. And I'm not, you know, having a go at anybody who falls outside of the generalization, but generalizations are valuable because they teach us something as a generalization. And you know what? It's not a bug, it's a feature. It's meant to be this way because you notice that the man, he was made facing the world. As a worker and a keeper made what for? For his purpose in the garden, it says, to work it, etc. And the woman is made facing the person. Very different, right? There's a reason for these things. Also, one more, women and babies. Women do want to be mothers. And younger, young, very young women in particular sometimes don't understand this, but I'm going to tell you right now, if you hit your 30s and you don't have children by design, uh, many, you, you may regret it. Uh, you may, I'm not saying everybody will, but you may regret it. Uh, and I just say that because there's a lot of lies that I think are hurting young women in this respect. Um, that, you know, for example, serving an employer is liberty, serving a family is slavery. I think you'll find the opposite is true in most cases. Um, or, you know, um, that, that career is this somehow tremendously fulfilling journey to be on. Uh, you know, the reality is you find out what we learn in Ecclesiastes, that work and labour and toil is vanity and empty and doesn't satisfy. You'll find that out uh, and you'll see that you don't have a career, you've got a job, you know, and you're trudging away doing a job and you'll find you're looking for fulfilment in other places. Um, and, you know, also this lie that political and commercial power is what it's all about. Well, you know, God doesn't actually usually work through political and commercial power. Did you know that? He works through other things. That's actually true. The more I think about that, as I said it, it's very true. Uh, usually, you know, one of the ways he works actually is particularly through motherhood. Uh, what an incredible, you know, the hand that rocks the cradle rules the world. I don't like the saying much, but there's a real truth in it. Anyway. Those are realities which simply confirm to us as generalizations that maybe there is a design feature here as to how we're made, and there really is. And those foundation stones from Genesis 1 to 3 really answer those questions. And they spill over, they actually create the foundations for what the New Testament says about male and female. And there's lots of places in the New Testament that talk about this. And they use words like headship, they use words like submission, they use words, all this. It's all built off of those basic principles. It's all consistent throughout. But anyway, let me use, mention this as a last point before I close. Um, I wanna make a few comments regarding the curse and gender. I mentioned that when the human race falls into sin, God curses the earth, he curses the serpent, he curses the man and the woman, right? Separately and different effects. Jointly, however, both man and woman have the image of God in them spoiled through sin, hence Christ, okay? Um, also, their authority over creation is spoiled by sin. We do not now see all things put under him, says the psalmist. You know, the authority that we had to have dominion over the earth and subdue it is broken. Um, also, our mandate to be fruitful and multiply is spoiled by death. And you'll see that in Genesis 9. It says, be fruitful and multiply, don't kill, right? It sets them up as contrasts. But also, the fall applies specifically to the man's role as worker. When God says to the man specifically, by the sweat of your face, you shall eat bread. In other words, work is spoiled. Work is subjected to vanity, Ecclesiastes, I mentioned it a moment ago. But also, the, the curse is specifically applied to the woman as mother. I will greatly multiply your pain in childbirth, says God. And good grief, talk about the art of understatement, right? Pain in childbirth, uh, that has such a full meaning throughout the history of women and motherhood and all that that means. Um, but also, something else will be undermined. It will be the two of them as made for each other. It says here, your desire shall be for your husband and he shall rule over you. Now, what in the world does that mean? Well, your desire shall be for your husband. It's a strange Hebrew phrase. It appears one other place exactly as it does there. And it's in Genesis 4 and 7 when God speaks to Cain. He says, if you do well, will not your face be cheerful? And if you do not do well, sin is lurking at the door and its desire is for you, but you must master it. In other words, sin wants to master you. You must master it. Isn't that interesting? The woman is not meant to be controlling. She's not meant to be mastering, conniving, orchestrating, manipulating, having designs, subverting, ruling via feminine craftiness and subtle and subversive means. Now, I often stick the boot into men because I am a man and because it's easy to stick the boot into men. But I think I just stuck the boot into women. 
and you know, I'll treat both sides fairly because I encounter this a lot. Women who want to control and get ahead and connive and plan and plot, it, it's, not, it's part of the curse. It's part of the curse. And then you look at the man. He shall rule over you. This is a curse. It's not a good thing, right? And this clearly, I think, refers to what we know from history without even thinking twice about it, which is that man is not supposed to be ruling over the woman through brutality, through oppression, through abuse, through subjugation, through cruelty, through brute means. And that is the proclivity. That is a great proclivity of men down through the ages. It is wrong. They were supposed, you see, to rule together in their proper places under God. She was supposed to be his help, his sucker, his strength and his champion, not his master and controller. She wasn't meant to wear the pants. Anyway, moving on. I said it. Um, and he was supposed to be responsible for her, in service to her for her highest good, not rule over her in an authoritarian way. You know, um, that's the New Testament. The man is supposed to completely think, consider himself nothing and lay it all down for the good of those he's called to be responsible for. Now, this explains a great deal. Conflict between male and female is in the fall itself. The fall has set men and women into a battle with one another, and it's why what I'm saying is so controversial. It really is. You know, um, it's from the oppression of women down through the ages to the attack on men and masculinity that we've seen so much in recent times. It explains the conflict narrative of our times that young men and women feel as though they're basically in competition with each other. There's a subtle conflict narrative that comes through that Marxist identity politics vein of thinking. And it's very, very sad and singleness is on the rise partly for that reason. And you say, I want to learn more about this subject. Well, guess what? I'm out of time. And this is a primer. And questions which I haven't answered are, what about single people? Yes, there's an answer for you. Uh, I haven't answered the question of the fundamental importance and virtue of motherhood throughout the Bible, uh, one of the most significant narratives of the Bible which is overlooked. Thirdly, what about the New Testament and all the things it says? How do they connect to this? Because they do seamlessly and perfectly. Um, that's a good, good question. I deal with those topics and more in my video, my long form lecture on this very subject, which is available on our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash AC Lobby. Uh, just search for Gender Agenda. It's got an orange thumbnail titled God's Gender Agenda. You can find it there. But I said that today and I spent quite a lot of time on it because when I read the Tavistock decision and when I reflected on this gender stuff, I realized the truth about this is not being told to our young people and they are only hearing lies. And when you don't know who you are as a man, when you don't know who you are as a woman, when you don't know what your calling in life is, when you don't know how you tick and function, you will hear these false ideas and these evil and poisonous ideas that are out there in the broader community and you'll go for them because there's no competing truth to adhere to. And it's so important that we tell the truth about gender and we tell what is a man and what is a woman loudly and proudly to the next generation. I'm Martin Niles, and that was the truth. Thank you for watching. Please like and subscribe by hitting the icons below and make sure you hit the gray bell as well so you get notified when there's a new video. And if you want to watch more, you can click on the links right about here. Thank you.